Okay, people are starting to show up. Um, yeah, I think we're ready. Excellent. Thanks to all the participants for joining. Uh, and are we live now, James? There's still people joining. Let's give them a minute. Yeah. I will be um, recording the session, but perhaps we can discuss afterwards okay. if you want to share the recording or not. Um, I know there might have been some discussion about the presentations. Okay. Um, so we can just, we can not record if people don't want to. We can share it if people don't want to. Let's, uh, let's yes, carry we'll on. To. Okay. Abbas? Yeah. Um, yes, I, yes I, I, I can't. Um, I, I can't share my presentation because I used some sort of sensitive um, information just sort of internally that I probably won't share on the slides today, but I'd be very happy to um, produce a document afterwards that, that I could we could use public facing. Uh, both are absolutely fine. Let me know if you want me to show the presentation, otherwise you can speak. But we're now live, so we should start. Yeah. Hello. Well, thanks to everyone for uh, coming to today's webinar. So this is an IDS member seminar um, for our panelists. It's basically a set of informal um, uh, events that uh, we have for our students and staff and other um, um, people in the university research community um, in which we engage in a series of reflections on different issues. The topic of this particular webinar is um, on learn, mutual learnings around the, the COVID response from the governments of Trinidad and Tobago, represented by Dr. Roshan Parasram, who is the chief medical officer um, and in charge of um, all the health activities in the country. And Dr. Elizabeth Jill, who uh, leads the, who's the chief medical officer and leads and just clinical commissions group for Sussex, which includes Barton and Hove, East Sussex and West Sussex sites. So thanks a lot for all of you to, um, uh, for coming to this webinar. Uh, the, without further ado, I'll let Jerry introduce uh, the theme of the sessions today and also maybe explain a little bit about the origins of the session, uh, which started from a session in health and development classes. That's right, Jerry. All right, well, any, okay, hello, I'm, I'm Jerry Bloom and I co-convene the health and nutrition cluster. And I think one of the areas of focus of our work is on mutual learning on the management of health system adaptation to shock and rapid change. So we were very pleased during our master's course when we heard about the excellent work that had been done in Trinidad and Tobago and very grateful to the, the master's students who really played a lead in organizing this session. Um, we're really pleased and with our links to the local NHS in Sussex and We've already organized in the past opportunities for mutual learning between cities in Brazil and in China and with Brighton. And so it's really an honor to host this exchange between the chief medical officer of Trinidad and Tobago and of Brighton and Sussex. And I think what we want to do is pose two questions. First, how have both health systems responded to the challenge of the COVID pandemic? And what lessons, and this is probably the more important for us, what lessons have emerged for strengthening primary healthcare services in the future. Um, we'll have two presentations um, by Dr. Parasram, Chief uh, Medical Officer of Trinidad and Tobago, and then Dr. Elizabeth Jill, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the Brighton and Sussex um, Healthcare Trust. Um, and I think we'll save the questions till after their presentations, but please, while they're speaking, feel free to enter questions in the chat and we will, we will harvest questions from what you put there. But I'm really pleased to first introduce um, Dr. Parasram, who will um, tell us about what's been happening in Trinidad and Tobago. So Dr. Parasram. Hi, good morning. Um, thanks, first of all, for the invitation to present at this event. Um, and really, um, thank you to the organizers for reaching out to Trinidad and Tobago so that we can share our story um, a few thousand miles away from you all at this point in time as to how we manage with the challenges that is facing all of us at this point in terms of COVID-19 across the world. Um, we all look towards the end of this pandemic in the near future, but I know one can predict with any degree of certainty when and if this is going to happen and how it is going to end. Um, so the way I have structured my presentation will be, um, if you can, uh, sorry um, that I'm leaning on you all to, to 
for these slides, but if you can go to my second slide, please. So basically, we will focus on the history of the pandemic as it, as it occurred in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we have gone through a number of phases. Where are we now in terms of um, the number of cases epidemiologically? And in terms of our health systems, what is happening in our hospital scenario at this point in time? The local context, some challenges, and then of course, some solutions that we have come up with and, and we hope that will hold us well going forward in this pandemic. Next slide. So as we all know, on December 31st, 2019, the Wuhan Municipal Corporation China reported a cluster of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan, Hubei province. A new novel coronavirus was eventually identified at the time it was being called coronavirus 2019. Of course, WHO declared coronavirus to be a pandemic, um, which is a signal to the rest of the world at that point in time that you know we needed to put systems in place to, to mitigate against the threat of this disease very quickly. Um, the transmission of the disease had the ability to overwhelm healthcare systems and we looked on as a small island developing state as, what, as to what was happening in China at the time, a uh, much larger um, country. And to see that their health system was overwhelmed in a very short space of time necessitating the need for them to put into place additional hospitals, which they did in very short order, um, but which again was, was going to capacity very quickly with this new virus. Put us all in a position that we were nervous um, across the globe and in Trinidad, more so because of our smaller health system. Um, and really we, we looked on and we looked towards the day that possibly um, that virus would come to Trinidad and Tobago. At, the, at that point in time, we have strong links with China, although we are far apart. We actually do a lot of commerce and trade and we utilize their, in the construction agency in Trinidad and Tobago, we use a lot of their, their personnel, equipment and elsewhere. So there's a lot of travel between Trinidad and China. Um, and for that reason, and, and for some others, we were concerned that there was a possibility, albeit remote in the early days, of that virus coming to Trinidad very quickly. Of course, as we all know, and history will tell us, the pandemic has since grown to over 137 million cases with nearly 3 million deaths as of a couple of days ago. And the global situation has evolved dramatically. 78% um, of the world cases being diagnosed in Europe, 85.2% and the Americas 42.7%. And despite these two regions, the rest of the world 23.3% in terms of the global population. Next slide. So again, just to give you a little background as to how, how, where we are and how we are, we are twin island states. So we are Trinidad and we have a smaller sister isle of Tobago. Our overall population is between 1.3 and 1.4 million people, relatively small. Tobago has a population of about 60 million people, very, very small. Um, two cities, two major cities, Port of Spain in the northwest of the country and San Fernando in the southwest. Population is primarily clustered along the north and south corridors of Trinidad and Tobago, what we call in Trinidad, the east-west corridor is highly populated and you'll see it in a, in a few maps when we begin to show some maps. Um, 13 hospitals across both, both islands with 104, and we have a few new ones taking us up anywhere between 104 and 109 health centers. A health center, of course, is a primary care facility that is smaller, usually open, varying between Monday to Friday. Some of them have extended hours into weekends as well, but it's a smaller setup and it's meant to increase the access to care across the population and it's focused on primary, primary health care and public health. Next slide. So again, geographic spread of the population, it just shows the density of the population in different parts of the country. The darker the green, of course, the higher the density of the population. And when you see the maps coming along, um, the east-west corridor is going from the northern, northwestern tip on the left-hand side all the way to the right-hand side of your screen on the upper, upper bit. And then, of course, going all the way down, you see there's a larger darker green on the southern side of the map, which is really San Fernando, one of the major cities. And there are clusters of populations around there. If you're looking at the east and the north, the northeast, and you see the southeast, you're seeing highly... Um, sparse population areas and we have seen when we look at the epidemic progressing of course those areas were spared in terms of number of cases significantly so next slide 
So this gives you an idea of what I described before in terms of our hospitals and our health centers. Again, you can see they're well um, spread across the entire country. So giving us um, that level of access to primary health care, the hospitals, again, um, the, the cross, the Red Cross, you can see the hospitals, AMR, and the service, of course, secondary tertiary and quaternary levels of care, um, again, well distributed throughout the country in both islands. Next slide. Yeah, so this is uh, giving you an idea with using utilizing our geographic information systems, which has really helped us greatly. Um, we started to use it quite a lot around 2014, 2016, when we actually had a Zika and chikungunya outbreak in the country. Um, we began to use the geographic information system then through the Insect Vector Control Division, which is a vertical unit of the Ministry of Health to map cases. And of course, now we're using it for other diseases like coronavirus. And it has really helped us to follow those epidemics do outbreak control in a very timely manner. Um, see where our clusters are, put our um, capacity into those areas very quickly so that we can actually test, treat, and contain, isolate any cases and clusters and, and really has gone a long way in helping our community effort for containment. Next slide. So the other slide just again um, highlights in terms of cases during the period March, April, 2021. So for the entire period, we would have had our first case on March 12, 2020, when we had a returning national who had gone to, at the time, Switzerland, returned to Trinidad, developed a fever a few days later, and of course was tested and, and later became our first case of COVID-19. So this graph gives you an idea of, again, where the cases have been in terms of greatest amount. And, and again, you see what I described as the east-west corridor on the north to south, um, trash um, corridor as well. That is where the populated areas are, and we expect that infectious diseases will predominate in areas where you have clustering of houses and close proximity of persons spreading from people, person to person. Next slide. So yeah, again, um, this is showing a two-week period commencing 8th of the 3rd, 2020. Um, this is just for a small period to show where the cases are now, and we see over the last few months, there have been a, a, a sort of clustering of cases in what an area called County Carony, which is in the center of the country, together with one right below on the south side called Victoria. So the country is broken into eight counties in Trinidad and one in Tobago. Um, and that is a geographic way of determining, one, um, the level of control. So it's actually broken into by county medical officers of health who are, each have a control of one of those counties in Trinidad, eight of those and one in Tobago. Next slide. So the, the other slide will give us, yeah, if you go forward, um, don't want to necessarily, right. So the age and sex distribution, really, again, we have seen more or less for the entire duration of the pandemic that we had a slight male preponderance of over 53%, but it has more or less been even. So mostly, um, sometimes during the, the pandemic, you'll see more females than males, and, and of course, more males than females from time to time. But it has been more or less equal. It, it is hovered around 53 to 47, sometimes 52 to 48, that kind of range. So it's more or less males equal female in terms of the infection rate, equal women in terms of men. But um, basically, if you go to the... To the um, there's a, there's a key point that stood out to me during the epidemic, and that does related to the deaths. We have found that three quarter of the deaths that occurred were, was in males, and one quarter of the deaths that occurred in females, and that occurred throughout the pandemic. So it is an odd feature that we noticed in Trinidad, um, and it's something that we were wondering if happened throughout the world as well, but it really maintained that a steady level of 75% of our deaths being males, 25% of our deaths being females. Next slide. So this gives you an actual context of what happened in Trinidad and Tobago from the beginning. When I said we had our first case on March 12, 2020, all the way to the left, you will see um, that first bit. And we actually had between what we categorize in Trinidad as our first phase, really March, I would say March 12th, when we had the first case, all the way down to July, we actually only had a small number of cases, relatively small number of cases in the country, 138, with eight deaths occurring during that period. 
So it was a very good period. What we had done very early on is we closed our borders to transit. Um, we continue to allow travel, um, travel of certain nationals through a repatriation exercise run by the Ministry of National Security. However, the majority borders were formally closed and the, the, um, the commercial transit, meaning that goods and services will be able to come in, continue throughout the pandemic. So during our, what we call our first phase, which is taking us up to just before July, we would have had 138 cases in the country with eight deaths, which is that little blue um, bit on the left-hand side. There's a tall peak that you would see going just above 40 occurring in one day. What we had is we had persons re returning aboard a cruise ship. Um, 72 nationals came back upon that cruise ship, and out of the 72 nationals, over 50 of them were positive, and that's that tall blue spike on the left-hand side of the graph. Um, what we did is, of course, continued. We had 85 days between our what we call our first phase and our second phase, where we had actually no cases of local transmission for 85 days. Our country was over able to open back in terms of having all the public health restrictions removed. And we were really in a very good place at that point in time, 85 days without any cases. What happened next um, surprised us to some extent. So okay. if you could, yeah, go back to the same slide. Yeah, so if you see the, there's a big upsurge that began. And, and what we noted is that two things, the number of cases that were in our neighboring continent, which is South America, and Venezuela in particular began to rise. So Venezuela at its closest point to Trinidad and Tobago, it is about seven miles away from our country, actually almost closer to Trinidad than maybe Tobago is. And what it allows for is there's a, a flow of illegal migrants that occurs between Venezuela and Trinidad and has been doing so for many years. Our concern in the past from an infectious disease point of view would have been malaria. And of course, more, more, now more so COVID-19. And what we saw in phase two, which is when that spike began, is the reintroduction of cases coming into Trinidad from an outside source, um, not through the legitimate borders. But campaigning involves very large groups of people going around the country, having rallies, having um, walkabouts, and people clustering, really not wearing their masks, not wearing their shields in very large numbers for quite a long period of time, almost two to three weeks that occurred. Um, we had the general election, which itself went smoothly on the day. Um, we had all the protocols in place. People followed the protocols. But what, what led up to the, to the election, not so much so. And we think that is what led to that massive spike that we had in August and September. In late August, after the election was done and dusted and the new party was, was sworn into office, we, we engaged them and we were able to have mandatory mask wearing legislated and implemented in late August. After, and you can see that point marked on the graph, thereafter you would have seen a precipitous fall in the cases going all the way down and we really got, there was one single high, high point there where you see prison cluster marked on the graph. Um, there was an infection that got into one of our major prisons and we took a, we, it really took a toll in terms of the number of cases that we saw at that particular point. Um, thereafter, it, it stabilized and we're back again into a bit of a cluster um, following what we call spring break in some parts of the world. People really clustered all, all over the beaches, um, the hotels, Again, not wearing their masks in close proximity, and we're seeing a, another third spike, if you want to call it. Next slide. Yeah, so again, just in local context, again, January 23rd, Ministry of Health monitoring COVID-19, coronavirus declared a pandemic on 11th, first case recorded on March 12th, the first wave as, wave, as we characterize it, March to July, really, of 2020, July to present a second wave with two forms. Um, a first, uh, first bigger one, as I described before, and then, of course, we're now seeing another cluster coming out of our what we call Easter events in some parts of the world, you call it spring break event. Um, mandatory mask wearing is very critical and has been critical for our population level control, initiated on August 31st, and February 21st, we had relaxation of strict restrictions on large groups and sports, which is a concern and has been pulled back in this year. Next slide. 
So again, first weight characteristic, 11th of March, local cases 138, that's eight. Um, new sites for testing was established. And, and during that period where we had the lows for 85 days, what we were able to do is actually expand our facility for testing. We had depended early on from the Caribbean Public Health Agency, which would have tested for all our Caribbean member states. We were able to establish our own lab system um, with accreditation of private labs as well during that period of time. So we now have the capacity to test um, close to 1,500 plus tests in terms of PCR on a given day. And of course, we have began the, the testing with rapid tests, which gives us, a, which is a PAHO WHO rapid test, which can give us an increased capacity to go towards the probable diagnosis. Next slide. So again, um, the hallmarks of, of the first phase was school remains school, school, all schools remain closed at that period in time. The borders remain closed. There was use of moral suasion in terms of public health, trying to get people to abide by stay at home. Of course, wearing your mask, social distancing and the like, which was new phenomenon and became known as the new normal across the world. We released guidelines for each sector, meaning that we had guidelines for going to restaurants and bars. Um, in terms of how to adapt to that new normal. So it was a period where we really were putting systems in place to, to build that um, public uh, communication for behavioral impact that we wanted to have. There was a phased approach to re reopening of the economy as well at that period in time, and no community spread was listed. We, we were listed in phase one as sporadic, um, had no community spread or, or cluster spread of period. Next slide. Yeah, so second wave characteristic, as I said, began when we had this, um, just before we had the general election in the country. I, again, increased testing capacity during that time, new testing site, and introduction of quarantine at home. What had happened is our policy initially was to quarantine every positive case in a COVID hospital. And we will speak a little bit about the parallel system shortly, um, parallel healthcare system. We went away from that quarantine in hospital, which we thought was ideal for, for already contact tracing and containment, um, obviously because we had outstripped or getting close to outstripping the number of beds that we had. And we had people who weren't that ill occupying beds. We changed that policy. And of course, people were allowed to stay home and nurse when they were, on, when they were not very um, ill. And we left that space in ICU, HDU, and the ambulatory wards for people who were very ill. So that, that policy change came around then. Um, again, uh, to avoid going out of essential workers, expansion of the workforce occurred where we hired quite a number of physicians and nurses who were unemployed at the time. They were leveraging of technology, um, PCR and other things, strategies to balance economic need for health security, evolving public health policy, and consistently reinforcing the public health messaging uh, through our press conferences, which we held at one point every day, including weekends and public holidays. <clears throat> and we had press releases as well. Um, next slide. So just quickly, um, there was, of course, during this phase, non adherence to the new normal, um, local community spread was, was really active. Um, introductory mandatory wearing of masks on August 31st. And of course, schools were preparing for what we call a, a matriculation exam called SEA going from standard five into the high school, uh, really we opened just for that exam and then closed back again. Focus on saving lives again and livelihoods and schools reopened using a hybrid system of virtual learning in term one of 2021, which, which continues to date. Um, we just have our four, four, five and six, which are 15 to 17 years old out at this point during practical session. Next slide. So I just wanted to focus on some of the um, just for the next couple of minutes, the parallel healthcare system, which is um, somewhat unique in, in, the, in, in our parts of the world, at least. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, we were in a good position where we were about to open two major hospitals. That was the Cuba Hospital and Multi-Training Facility with a capacity of about 230 beds, including upwards of 15 ICU and 20 HDU beds, as well as the Arima General Hospital, which again had a capacity of 150 people with ICU and HDU. Um, coming on stream, and what we what we really did is is utilize that system. There was two hospitals to treat COVID positive cases, both suspect and confirmed only. So the suspect were treated at the Arima facility, 
and the confirmed were all sent to Cuba. And it allowed us really to bring those centers as a parallel system to our existing hospitals and health centers so that no cases of COVID positive were seen in our 10 other major hospitals. Um, really, it allowed us to separate COVID-19 from our systems. And even in the major hospitals, we developed what we call COVID tents or, or viral illness tents at the hospitals and at all 104 major um, health centers where anyone with viral illness symptoms would be treated in a separate trap. Um, so a parallel trap where they would be seen very quickly, triage, determine what you have, swab, sent back home to quarantine if we had a suspicion that you were suspected. So there was no commingling between viral illness and any other cases that were seen. It allowed us to continue our normal hospital care, elective surgeries, our outpatient clinics, um, and managing all other diseases in our major systems and having a separate parallel system for COVID-19. I think it was one of the, one of the um, being fortunate to have those hospitals coming on stream at just about the time when we were going, to, going into COVID um, really bore us out in terms of being able to separate the systems. And what it has redounded to is of course, maintaining the normal system, decreasing the, the rate of infection among our healthcare workers, having very little infection among the healthcare workers with of course the use of PPE and IC, IPC mechanisms as well. Um, but really, really bringing us um, that parallel system is something that we really, really feel made a difference in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, next slide. So again, the other big thing that I wanted to focus on was the use of legislation. Everyone, Trinidad has a written constitution where, where of course, we have um, laws that are enshrined and, of course, we have human rights and we have um, persons, of course, saying that they have certain rights and which is enshrined in the, in the constitution. Um, so what we do is Trinidad and Tobago has a dangerous disease act called the Public Health Ordinance. And on January 31st, the President of the Republic would have declared COVID-19 to be a dangerous, at the time it was called coronavirus, a dangerous infectious disease, which allowed us to use the public health ordinance to do things like mandatory mask wearing in public. Of course, we were able to adjust the times of opening of beaches, for example, closures of restaurants and bars to in-house only. And we did all of this under the public health ordinance. The Quarantine Act of the Land, of course, is for persons entering the, the borders through the sea or the air, and it allows for measures to be taken to isolate and to quarantine individuals under that particular piece of legislation so that um, we, we wouldn't have had the need to do it against persons' will, but again, we would have been taken to court as the state a number of times to try to do habeas corpus, meaning getting people out of quarantine and the laws would have stood up and the courts would have stood up and, and attested to the, based on the quarantine act and the public health regulation that the state had that ability to contain infectious disease. Um, next slide. So this is just to give an example of how we did phase reopening in phase one. So you see different things coming in phase one, May 10th to May 23rd. We reopened food establishments and restaurants, itinerant and non-itinerant businesses allowed to commence, curbside pickup and deliveries and pickup. You go all the way down to phase four, for example, you see that the capacity in the public service, which as a government ministries was increased and, and we allowed flexi time at that period in time, alternating office days, um, hairdressers and spas were well, allowed to open, reopen. And really and truly up to July, we were doing very well with no cases for 85 days. Um, we were able even open it, open up to phase five, which allowed for places of worship to reopen, cinemas and bars, um, and malls, including their food courts, were allowed to reopen. When we got to phase six, that's when we saw the election spike and we had to hold on to phase six and we never got to phase six at that point in time. Next slide. So again, just to end with the last few slides with a few challenges that we had, the sustainability of a parallel healthcare system, meaning um, to have staff and all the systems consumables to maintain a parallel health system has been a challenge, especially in a situation where the globe has faced economic challenges. So we continue to maintain the parallel system, albeit not at that scale. Um, at the Cuba Hospital, we continue, we have downscaled the Arima Hospital and gone back to the normal levels of care in that facility um, because the number of cases has decreased as well. So testing capacity constraints at times, um, were a critical issue that we had in, in August and September where we had large numbers of cases. 
um, information services, again, tracking patients and resources, non adherence to guidelines and protocols by members of the public, on, uh, I suppose, um, which lends itself to believe that, you know, communication strategies need to be a little more robust. Mandatory mass, moving from moral suasion to legislation and self-management and conditions of quarantine facilities continues to always be a concern in terms of capacity um, and our ability to treat with it. Next slide. So some of the solutions, again, expansion of testing facilities locally, utilizing a public-private partnership as well at some point in time, increased capacity of healthcare professionals throughout the system, reduced distribution of staff, revised treatment and care protocols in alignment with WHO, use of technology, local manufacturing of PPE, which actually occurred, um, a number of people from the private sector stepped in and began to produce PPE and other non-farm supplies. And I'm happy to say really throughout the pandemic, we were able to maintain a, a very good supply of PPE to all our clinicians. Continued intersectoral collaboration, of course, change in public health regulation, with the closure of beaches and other places, focus on lives and livelihood. Um, and we always have that balance between the economic bit of it and of course, knowing when and where to, to to adjust our public health regulations, strengthening public health measures in general. Last slide, I think it's next is the last slide. Yeah, so the way forward, of course, as we as we stand, um, again, having that peak, everybody has pandemic fatigue across the world. Is it is, it is a phenomenon that we have seen in Trinidad and Tobago. And in our Easter break, people really showed um, lack of adherence to the new normal. They behaved as if there was no more COVID-19, and I think it was in part due to pandemic fatigue. Um, so we had two weeks of that, and we're seeing a post the spike now. So again, we need to continue our enforcement of the new normal, strengthening health promotion campaign. We need to try to, to reinforce the legislation of masks. So the police service has to do their enforcement bit, which has not been at, at best because of their capacity to really go out there and legislate and, and enforce the legislation related to mask wearing with the collaboration again with national security and heightened social responsibility. So I believe I will end there for this morning and later on I think we will take any questions and concerns that you all have. Thank you again. Well, well thank you very much Dr. Parasram for a really um, very clear summary of what you've been doing over the past year. I think we will ask um, Dr. Jill to comment from the um, the experience of Brighton and, and, and Sussex first, and she may well have some questions for you, and then we will move on to the general questions. And I, I encourage people to put questions in the chat box. Sure. So, so Dr. Jill. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, is it possible to get my slides up on the screen? Um, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Parasram, for that really interesting presentation. And I know that I've only got um, 10 minutes, so I'm coming at this from quite a different angle, if you like, from the Sussex response. Um, and I found it so interesting to hear what you did in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and that actually the difference, I think, between you and us is you were actually able to contain the pandemic. Um, whereas we in Brighton Hove, we became the epicenter of the European pandemic um, in the middle of February in 2020, when a, an index case came back from a skiing holiday in the Alps. Um, and we suddenly found that we had nosocomial spread throughout the whole of the city of Brighton and Hove. And there were, the numbers became so high so quickly that we were actually unable to go for a containment um, policy. So we had to actually work in, in quite a different way. So it was so interesting to hear your perspective there. So thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the Clinical Commissioning Groups in Sussex, who basically purchase um, and monitor the quality of all the healthcare services within Sussex. So that's mental health trusts, acute hospitals, primary care, community care. Um, so we have all over the overarching responsibility to, to look after the quality of care for our population as well as purchasing the care. Um, I'm a primary care physician as well, still practicing. So next slide, please. Um, 
Interestingly, um, we have the same population in Sussex, pretty much, that you have in the whole of Trinidad and Tobago. So Sussex is a historic county of southeast England. Um, it covers a coastal area um, and it's got three local authorities, um, East Sussex, West Sussex and Brighton and Hove. Um, and as I say, um, there are three clinical commissioning groups, um, which is where I work. We're now moving to some more legislation um, for something called the Sussex Health and Care Partnership, um, which is an integrated care system, uh, which is a really exciting movement within the NHS because uh, we've realised that so many parts of the health care health and care system have often operated in isolation from each other and this is all about bringing everybody together with public health and the councils so that we can actually uh, deliver integrated health and care across the system um, and it's a, a, a four billion pound uh, spend that we have with um, 30,000 staff so you know as you all know the NHS is a, is a huge organisation um, during the height of the pandemic, um, we, we actually had to buy extra independent sector beds to actually meet the capacity. At one, uh, I think at the highest point of our third wave, we had 535 inpatients, which occupied over 40% of our beds. Um, and our I, ITUs were swamped in that we had, um, you know, over double what we would normally be expecting to see in our intensive care beds so it was a real challenge to our system and I was going to talk about how we responded to this as a health system um, so next slide please what we did was we adopted a, a com command and control um, uh, situation in response to the major incident that was across the whole of England. Um, and we escalated to something called a level four major incident. Um, so the NHS England formally delegated the role of being the NHS Sussex system commander to our chief executive officer of our system, Mr. Adam Doyle, who was responsible for overseeing um, how we actually dealt with the whole of the COVID-19 major incident um, and made sure that we implemented the national guidance. Um, and, and this involved a multi-agency partnership response. Uh, so we all had um, statutory responsibilities under the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004 um, in order that all of us responded um, together. So we, we worked with all our emergency services, our National Health Service, Public Health England, the Environment Agency, the military, um, to make sure that we all came together as this really resilient group of people that could respond to this pandemic, which was hitting the whole of um, our country very badly uh, by mid-March. So we set up um, in three tiers. So we had a gold level, which was established to oversee the sort of multi-agency response in, in the county. And we established what we called the daily battle, battle rhythm, whereby gold was meeting in the morning and the evening, um, Gold was handing out the actions to the Silver Group, which is the tactical coordinating group um, that m basically made sure that all the operational um, plans were responded to. Um, and that way we were able to cascade down guidance that came out from central government out into the wider system. Um, and we also stood up a number of cells that could respond to the incident in different ways, which I'll come to in a schematic diagram in the next few slides. Um, and we also had a bronze level, which was sort of the operational layer who would go out and actually respond and uh, design and implement the plans. Um, so next slide, please. So yes, as I say, the gold made the strategic um, level decisions um, so that we really responded to the incident. And then the silver would do the, make the tactical decisions. So there was really robust decision making 
that happened so quickly um and then the bronze members of staff would assess the nature of the incident and then really concentrate on the specific tasks in response and liaise across the whole system to make sure that we really rapidly and effectively implemented the actions um and next slide please there's a schematic diagram um and what I did with our doctors, so I've got 11.8 um, whole time equivalent um, clinical leads working for me in the chief medical officer directorate. Um, and what I did with those doctors was I would, I, I was the gold leader, so I would pick up the actions in the morning, cascade them through to silver, um, which were my local medical directors, who then cascaded the actions out to the bronze um, uh, work streams and cells. Um, and in this way, uh, we made sure that things were implemented on a daily basis and then reported back up to gold in the evening um, so that we made sure everything had been covered off um, because there was so much guidance coming out from the centre. I think um, we would have... Uh, you know, at least 20 new pieces of guidance a day that we had to adhere to. So next, please. Um, and this is just a sort of overall picture of how complex the situation was in Sussex, in that we've got um, uh, three major hospital trusts. Um, we've got one mental health trust, one community care trust, and an ambulance trust. And then we've got 180 primary care individual businesses as well across uh, the system. So somehow we had to link them all in. And you can see the schematic here, whereby gold is sort of in charge of all the different elements of the system. Um, and very important to this was um, the supporting the professional reference groups that sat underneath the gold. Um, so we had the chief medical officers, the chief nursing office officers, the HR directors and the chief finance officers all meeting daily as well to pick up any of those very difficult clinical decisions or um, workforce decisions or finance decisions that needed to be done on a daily basis. Um, and then you can see there were a number of work streams that sat underneath this. Um, I was responsible for staff testing. Uh, we also had work streams responsible with um, PP for PPE, um, the volunteers we had coming back into the system, primary care resilience. We've got one of the highest number of care homes um, per head of population in the whole country. Um, so that was a real issue in that cases there were extremely high as well. Um, and we made sure that there were clinicians involved in all of these work streams and this was absolutely critical I think to to the success because they could support the managers with that really crucial clinical information that they got from the front line working um, and I think you know one of the things I would really take away from this was the fast pace that we responded um, was, was something I've never seen in my working life. And everybody had to be incredibly flexible, collaborative, and pull on all of their transferable skills. Um, and I think that is how we managed to, to get through this as a system. Um, and we had one of the lowest death rates in the whole of, of the UK. Um, I know no death, um, it, it is welcomed obviously, but we managed to contain um, the number of deaths in a really quite critical um, situation, really due to this daily battle rhythm that we had. Everybody knew and understood their roles. Um, all actions were cleared down daily. Um, the CMO structure was aligned to the command system and communication and collaborat collaboration were absolutely uh, key to the success of this. Um, I know we're short of time. Um, I was going to talk about um, the health inequalities disparity that we found due to COVID, but um, I don't think there's time for that today, really, is there? We can have a few more minutes. A few more minutes? You know, if, if, if you, I think it would be very interesting okay. for everyone. OK, if, if we can go on perhaps to um, if we can go three slides forward, please. Um, I mean, Sussex has got um, a much healthier life expectancy than the national. Next slide, please. 
that's it, thank you, um, than the national average. Um, but we have got some real pockets of depra deprivation along the coastal strip um, and also some significant mental health needs there and a higher than national average number of, of people with dementia. Next slide, please. And what we found quite quickly on is that COVID um, really showed a disparity in the outcomes between our different populations and had had a disproportionate impact on a number of groups. Um, and those were those living in a disadvantaged area, uh, those from black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities, older people, people with mental health and people with learning disabilities. Um, next slide, please. Um, we absolutely got commitment to um, tackling this and th this is quite a major piece of work that I'm responsible for generally in healthcare. Um, but actually what we did when we came to the vaccination program, it, we did find that more affluent populations came forward first, um, particularly white affluent populations. So we have put in um, five high impact initiatives to make sure that we're reaching out to um, our other communities who don't necessarily come forward, not only for vaccination, but for general healthcare as well. Um, so we, we've got um, a vaccination bus that goes out uh, to geographical areas that are hard to reach, and also to different faith communities, different ethnic communities. And we're using our um, community champions from uh, all sorts of different communities to try and promote the vaccination program with great success. I mean, in our learning disability um, community, we've seen an increase in uptake of 10% over the last two weeks with these high impact initiatives. Um, we've seen increased uh, uptake with our homeless community and our ethnic minorities. And we found it's really by understanding our population, um, using small grants to help, um, to help our um, sort of populations really in need to come forward ha has been really key to um, the success of the vaccination program. And I think we're going to use this um, with all of our future work with um, our populations um, suffering from health inequalities, because it's shown us the vehicle to reach those populations, how we sort of reached out with tentacles, both with uh, clinicians, but also with our faith leaders, our community leaders, and so on, um, and actually taking the care out to those groups rather than waiting for them to come to us. So it's been a really fascinating um, and very useful piece of work to do. Um, and I think we are now at 95% of our population in cohorts one to 10 vaccinated, which I think is, um, you know, been a really significant achievement. Oh. Thank, you Thank you very much for, I mean, we've had two excellent presentations um, by two people who have been really on the front line of the response <coughs> to COVID. So, and there's always a lot more one can say. I, we've had a few questions and we only have about 10 or so minutes. So I think I'm gonna put one sort of gentle, one that came up was asked specifically about Trinidad, but I think we could ask of both. I mean, it's clear in both cases, there's been this problem. Um, and I think we're looking particularly at primary healthcare level at both dealing with people who have the COVID, but also all the other health problems. And someone asked the question about how that was managed in Trinidad and how important this parallel system was. But of course, you've had the same problem in, in, in the UK about how do we deal with the ongoing primary healthcare problems. And the second question raised about Trinidad was how, were, how did Trinidad um, deal with supporting people to follow guidelines? Were there financial incentives? Was it more continuing publicity? And I guess we've had similar issues here. And, and and then to, if you have a minute, each of you at the end, I guess it would be either one key lesson for the future that from this very intense experience, what's at least one key lesson for the future. And maybe are there some parallel, are there some areas where there's been some interesting um, less potential learning in the future between Trinidad and Tobago and Brighton. So an awfully big agenda for the next few minutes, but Dr. Parashram, there was a lot of interest in the, 
in both the parallel system and, and um, how you were convincing people to follow guidelines. Okay, sure. So um, the, if we could start with the parallel healthcare system and the maintenance, I mean, the, the key to having a parallel system is really, it's premised on really having a separate system, one, so that infections are not getting um, to the healthcare workers who are not assigned to COVID-19 in particular. So we have separate tracks. Um, in the primary care system, for example, as I described what we call viral tent, that model had been used before for um, SARS way back uh, 10 years ago or thereabout um, and has worked well. So we had some, some element of using it before in Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, having separate hospitals for COVID-19 really went a long way, um, keeping it out of our system. Um, but I, I think what the, the fundamental issue as well is aside from keeping it on separate tracks, was being able to maintain the delivery of healthcare to everyone else. Um, so persons who would not have had COVID, um, pregnant patients who needed to deliver as normal, um, was, were able to maintain that level of care to, to everyone else and treat COVID almost like a separate disease, just in a separate place and a separate time with separate workers. Um, was something that really it took a lot of work to get going. We had to hire new staff, of course. Um, and we were able, because we had such a good containment effort in phase one, it gave us almost six months to put that parallel system in place. Um, so really because of the work of the CMOHs and everyone that, that treated and really the, the government of the day really stood behind us and believed in, in our public health guidance. And it could have been completely different had they not. Um, they maintained the closures of the borders, which is very good to, to be on an island and have that separation to keep things out. So put our, put our border control strategies in place. Um, it really gave us that much needed time to put our systems in place to develop the parallel healthcare system. Um, and really uh, during that time, we were trying to educate the public. By we, as I said, we, I was on television together with my Minister of Health um, and senior technical advisors, almost on a daily basis throughout the first phase, all the way into July, I would say. Um, basically talking about every single topic, bringing experts from different fields on with us, um, which would be a, a hour long program every single day. Um, the press, we would present for about a half an hour and then the press would be asking questions, the burning topics of the day for another half an hour. In addition to which we were able to send press releases up, I think at one point, 10 in the morning, 4 p.m. and 10 p.m., which would tell people how many cases there were, how many deaths there were, um, and any pertinent pieces of information that was required for the public to respond, um, setting the stage for the new normal. So it, it was a robust public education in the early days to try to get people to understand what was going on internationally and locally and really get them to adhere to the new guidelines. Um, yeah, so, so more or less, that's how we dealt with the primary care situation. I don't know if um, you want to go ahead with your, with your primary care bit first, and then we can discuss the last question. Okay, well, I must say we're getting other questions. So I, I, I wonder, if Dr., because we have such a rare chance to hear, hear your thoughts, Dr. Parastram, we could ask a, a, a couple of other reflections that people have raised, and then we'll come back to Dr. Gill. People have raised, I, I guess, the question, you mentioned that you already had some preparedness on how to deal with outbreaks from previous ones. Sure. And there was a question about what you've learned, and I guess on the other side, um, as the pandemic continues in, in certainly in Venezuela and in Brazil, and as new variants emerge, what do you see the big challenges and how do you see tackling this problem over the next year or so? Yeah, so, so I think the outlier in all of this first has been, so we have maintained the closure of the borders, as we said, but that's the, of course, legitimate borders. We have illegal migration that occurs because we are so close to the, to the Southern um, South American mainland that occurs consistently. And because Brazil has P1 coming across to the land borders to those territories, we, we of course are significantly concerned with illegal immigration of that particular strain. And of course the impact on vaccination, um, whether the vaccines will be as efficacious for, and we have seen you know, some studies already saying that there's a 2.5 decrease in the antibody response to P1, for example. Um, so that is, that is a concern that is always at the back of our minds that, you know, Although we have that, that border closure, there's an illegal entry that is occurring and, and it, is, it is concerning. By way now, in the initial days, it would have been concerning by, in terms of keeping that infection out, but now we're concerned about variants coming in. 
Um, so it is it is a real concern that we have, and it is a challenge. Being a small island state that is prone to migration, I mean, we're not unique in that regard. It happens all over the world, um, but it's something that is very concerning and continues to be a threat to the response. Um, vaccine supply is a concern for small, and I can I can speak on behalf of my CARICOM sisters and brothers really. Um, we have put all, all our eggs into the COVAX facility. And in terms of delivery of equitable vaccine to the Caribbean region, we have not gotten what we thought we would have got um, in, terms of, in terms of our supply. Um, we have asked for donations from India and, the, and other countries, which we have recently got, and we are thankful for the government of India. And of course, the government of China has, had proposed to us once WHO approves that they can do the same. So our reliance on COVAX has been heavy but we have not been given what we thought we deserved um, in terms of COVAX. We were passed by passing our first phase and we just started our major campaign on the 6th of April, which is extremely late compared to people who would have started in December. So we are a little bit on the back foot in terms of the vaccine drive, but we're hoping that in the next few months we will get additional supplies and we will push forward to vaccinate our population. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> a lot of questions. Dr. Jill, do you have some reflections. I mean, a lot of the questions are also relevant to your experience, including yeah. we're also an island and also are facing some of these similar challenges. Someone raised the question about the, of course, having people arriving in, in New Haven. So mm. I don't mm. know how many of these things you, you feel you can comment on at the moment and would be helpful. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, you know, we, we did have sort of our red and green zones in our hospital and keep the patients separate, but we found that nosocomial spread was a real issue, especially when the variants started coming in. So uh, it was just spreading so quickly through the hospital populations during the sort of third spike in December time. Uh, we kept a primary care open, they went into using a lot of virtual consultations, so doing video consultations, telephone consultations, very strong infection prevention control measures in primary care. So there was li very little spread in the primary care setting. The issue we've got is people didn't come forward. So we're having a sort of surge demand now where people had just kept their symptoms to themselves for the last year and are now coming forward. Um, and certainly I totally agree that uh, that piece around the communications. Um, we had day, daily communications. We've now got a good test and trace system up and running. Um, and, and our chief medical officer, uh, Professor Chris Whitty, did those daily um, uh, meetings with our prime minister, Boris Johnson. Um, so that was sort of done at a national level, which um, obviously I wasn't really involved in, in in Sussex, but it sounds like, I think the reflection is communicate with the population really regularly to get their buy-in. Well, I'm a bit sad to say that we're, we've already taken up our hour, but I, I, I guess before we end, it would be good to get at each of your reflections, whether it's about preparedness for the future or about the implications from all this investment of effort for how you might strengthen primary healthcare services or capacity to respond. What would be the one or two key lessons you're taking forward or you'd like to transmit to, to um, your counterparts? Dr. Par Parasram? Yeah, so so I, um, I said before that, that COVID-19 will do for us in public health what 9-11 has done for global security. Um, in a sense, the, it, I mean, never waste a good crisis, some people say. Um, we have gotten a lot of resources that we have been fighting for and helped for a number of years um, that we could not get. Um, support to expand our GIS, for example, support to expand our parallel system, to, to hire additional healthcare workers, to develop a telemedicine system, which is, has become part of the COVID-19 response. So during a crisis, there is a crisis, yes, but we have seen a freeing up of resources that we haven't seen for over a decade to public health, and there's an, a general understanding now by the public as to the need for public health and what we do on a basis, on a daily basis. It has really brought to the fore what public health practitioners do and the need for health systems to be strong. Um, so really and truly, we need to strengthen the surveillance systems a little more for infectious disease. And not only in Trinidad, I think a lot of places in the world, um, there needs to be that um, 
general sense of what needs to be done for public health. Of course, prevention, and people have really taken heed, you know, mask wearing, washing your hands, sanitizing, the simple things, but how important the simple things are and that we do it right and we do it consistently to prevent in this world that we really have globalization, prevent the spread of infectious disease across the world. Dr. Jill, key lessons Thanks. that have come from this daily, daily um, responding for how to take things forward. Yes, thank you. And I, I absolutely uh, agree with Dr. Parashram's uh, reflections. I mean, I, I, I think they're absolutely true. Um, and I would say um, for me, um, it, it's the, the highlight this has shown on health inequalities in the UK. Uh, they've just been thrown into really sharp focus. So the way we commission healthcare has got to change and particularly around primary care, we've got to reach out to the hard, those, those groups that don't always come forward for healthcare. Um, I think the NHS and public health have got to work closer together because um, we found we work really well um, when, we're, when, when we pool our resources. Abs it's absolutely crucial to do that going forward. Um, and I think it's shown how resilient our primary care has been under pressure because um, they have basically delivered the majority of the vaccination programme while delivering their day-to-day -day services. So I think it's shown that, you know, the, the re resilience and flexibility of primary care has, has been crucial to respond to the pandemic. Um, and that needs to be recognised, I think, in the way we commission primary care in the future. Well, thank you. Well, we have, I have to say we have many more questions. You've stimulated a lot of people to be, be thinking about these things, but I know you are both extremely busy. And so I don't want to keep you longer than you ha had agreed. Um, so I guess what, I, what, well, first of all, I'd like to thank both of you for taking the time to join us. And I think to confirm again, how important it is to talk to people who are really at the front line of responding and how, how important it is for us to be aware. Also to say how much we value these exchanges with, with, with the NHS in Brighton and bringing them together with people from other countries. Um, I also like to thank Sarah Jane Mungo and, and the students in the master's course who had the insight that it would be useful to organize this and put in the energy to do so. So I hope this is the first, at least now, of, a, of, a, of future reflections. Um, but right now, I'd like to thank you very much and um, look forward to further discussions in the future. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again for, for the invitation for Trinidad and Tobago as well. We would love to visit you there. <laughs> Hopefully as soon as our borders will reopen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good day. You okay. too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.